This is Isaiah Cassidy. I'm Mark Lynn, and we're Private Party. And you're listening to the All Elite Podcast. How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to the All Elite Podcast right here in the No Holds Bar Network, your source for wrestling podcast content. I'm your host of the All Elite Podcast. As always, your self-proclaimed greatest host, Kyle Masters, and I'm always joined by my co-host. She is the executive vice president of Giggles, the heartbreak <laughs> chick herself, Tiffany. What's going on, Tiffany? Hi, what's going on? <laughs> and uh, we're here on episode number 41, a special episode this week, and a double episode. You guys are getting double dose of AEP this week. Uh, we are here with none other and interviewing the, uh, I'm going to call him the lead official here in AEW, Rick Knox. Rick, what's going on? Oh, not a lot. How are you guys doing? Good, good. Excited for this interview. We were just uh, chatting a little bit before uh, recording here and saying how giddy we were to get this uh interview going and uh we do want to thank you again for joining us here on the podcast I really do appreciate this and uh getting the AEW fans out there to get a little bit uh, get a little more knowledge of who rick knox is the referee sure well hey it's my pleasure i always enjoy uh, doing this sort of thing i don't get to do it very often and a, a while back i actually kind of put a moratorium on him and was like kind of refusing to do them and mm. i don't know i just kind of got tired of telling the same story over and over but things have gotten a little more interesting now and uh story's gotten better so now i guess it's worth coming on and talking about again Yay. awesome awesome so we're definitely excited for this so uh before we get anywhere guys just really quickly if you guys want to follow us on social media we're available on i on uh, sorry twitter instagram and facebook every description is located down in the youtube description below for you at all elite pod or at all elite podcast where you can find us if you need help clicking the right uh social media link just head on over to youtube Make sure you're hitting that subscribe button. Most importantly, the little bell icon for notifications and uh, click the description box. It have all your links there to how to follow us on our sh- social medias, where to take us on the go uh, with you. If you guys want to take us on the go, we're on Spotify, uh, Google Play Music, everywhere. You got to take your podcast. The Ali podcast is ready for you guys to take uh, us. Also want to give a quick shout out to our friends, These Wolves, the band who do the theme song for the Ali podcast. I'm wearing their T-shirt right now in the video version of this podcast do want to give them another shout out and thanks for letting us use the song dead to me which is the official theme song of the all elite podcast so thank you very much let's get in this interview guys why not let's jump right into it here and uh we'll start off with the first question uh rick uh, just you know tell us a little bit about yourself maybe not a lot here but uh a little about yourself how long you've been doing this uh this refereeing business and professional wrestling for and what kind of inspire you to become a professional wrestling referee well, um, basically, I uh, was a long-time wrestling fan um, since, I mean, some of my earliest childhood memories of, of life in general were <laughs> centered around, like, Freddie Blassie and John Tolas and stuff nice. like that. You know, as you, growing up, uh, being born in the late 60s like I was, those early years of, uh, you know, my childhood, TV was the babysitter, so there was wrestling mm-hmm. on TV. I used to always joke that Freddie Blassie was on our TV so much I thought he was a family member at the time, you know, growing up. <laughs> but really, I, I, you know, and then I kind of just grew up a little bit and, and didn't become really a, a big fan of wrestling until I was, you know, maybe around 14, 15 years old, which would have been maybe early 80s, 83, 84 maybe. And that was when I started really watching it every weekend with my dad. Uh, then... Um, you know, pretty much I would wake up on Saturday mornings, I would scour the TV guide looking for when, you know, wrestling was going to be on. And, you know, it was pretty exciting Saturday morning. You had, you know, UWF at 8, Pro Wrestling this week at 9, World Class at 10, wow. WWF at 11. Then there'd maybe be a breaker for an hour or two, then NWA would come on at 3, and 
you know, it, and then Lucha Libre would come on uh, late uh, Saturday night. So, I mean, uh, the weekends were always built around just watching as much wrestling as I could. And uh, never really thought I wanted to get into it, never really pursued it or even really entertained the idea at all of, of really being involved other than just going to the shows and taking pictures and stuff like that. Um, and then in basically probably around 1995 or 96, I noticed, uh, or started reading, uh, about a local independent promotion with the local wrestling school that was very close to my house. And it was the school of hard knocks in San Bernardino, <laughs> California. They had a promotion, the EWF empire wrestling federation, and they ran, you know, my shows and all that. And, uh, I decided to go check it out and quickly just kind of fell in love with the whole indie wrestling scene and started out pretty much the same way. A lot of guys who aren't wrestlers started out taking pictures, doing programs, doing artwork, graphics, uh, setting up chairs, you know, all that stuff. And, uh, I used to go hang out at their school, the school of hard knocks, uh, on the nights when they would do <clears throat> their classes and usually, at, I, I never would get in the ring or, or train to wrestle because once I saw up close what it was like, I, I quickly realized I could not do that. Uh, That's interesting. I, I couldn't take bumps like that continuously. <laughs> couldn't take the chops like that. I had no illusions that I, I was not cut out to be a wrestler. Mm -hmm. But I still wanted to be involved. So basically, I would go watch their uh, classes, and then uh, when they were done, they would throw together six-man tag, eight-man tag, whatever, who was there, you know, quick little match with no finish, just practice match. Uh, hey, you know, Rick, get in there and referee. <laughs> and so started kind of doing that, and uh, after a while, some of the guys who were in the classes at the time, like uh, Frankie Kazarian, Chris Daniels, uh, Rico Costin, you know, started telling Bill and Jesse, Bill Anderson and Jesse Hernandez, the guys who were running the school at the time, that, hey, this, this guy's good enough to be on the shows. So you just start booking him. And, awesome. uh, and, you know, I'm doing it in front of an audience and just still doing it 20, 23 years later. Wow. That's awesome. It's funny you say that about uh, seeing it up close and taking the bumps and stuff because I actually have a, a good friend of mine who's uh, wrestling for a few independent promotions up here in Canada. And I've gone to a lot of his shows and I've, I've been in there uh, when they're uh, practicing before the show even started. I'm, and I literally Rick, think the same thing. I'm like, Oh, in my back of my head, I'm like, I could probably become a professional wrestler. And then when I get there and see what they go through, I'm like, yeah, probably not. <laughs> I feel like my ribs break just watching them. I don't think I couldn't imagine just repeatedly taking the bumps like they do. I mean, if I was, you know, I'm not a big guy. I never was. I don't have a lot of body mass, a lot of weight. So to get tossed around and take bumps like that, I knew if I did that, it would be a very short and quick career. Uh, but you know, being a referee, so you have to kind of be involved and stay active and be part of the the show, so to speak. And uh, I think that's kind of why I, I chose being a referee. Uh, over being a manager. Also, there was a guy who, uh, a wrestler at the time named Devon Willis, who was uh, a referee for the EWF. And I remember watching him and just kind of enjoying his work and thinking, man, I, I can do what he's doing. And, and he kind of inspired me to actually put the stripes on and start doing it. So oh. got to give some, some love to, to Little D. Oh, shout outs to Little D. Yeah. Why <laughs> though? Um, so all, so to all the new AEW fans out there and to those who haven't seen you referee before, what kind of referee would you say describes you? Are you the, are you the follow by the books type or are you the Nick Patrick, Chad Patton style of crookedness? <laughs> so I'm de de definitely not crooked. I, I'll never admit <laughs> anything like that. No, but really, I, 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 if I guess what I'm kind of known for, obviously what's made my name in wrestling is the fact that I do or have tended to get involved in matches, particularly at uh, PWG, Pro Wrestling Guerrilla, and, and with the Young Bucks in particular. I mean, we had a whole two, two and a half year long feud, basically, that finally culminated with us wrestling each other. But um, yeah, so I, I get involved sometimes, but not as in a crooked sense. I mean, if anything, I'm there kind of dishing out some justice and trying to even up some odds, so to speak. Uh, right. So, yeah, I mean, Google my name and you'll see a lot of really fun, fun YouTube clips of me and the oh, Young yeah. Bucks. I watched a couple. <laughs> yeah. We're all in. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
how does uh so we got a fan tweet here that we'll get to first here so we have one from amy a uh, good friend of ours we met her live in person during wrestlemania weekend uh really awesome she's really active in the twitter community for wrestling um she asks uh how does your role change if the match deviates from what's expected have you ever had a instance where someone unexpectedly brought out tables or chairs or how do, and how do you handle something like that um generally speaking that that doesn't really happen thankfully or hasn't happened i mean sometimes things do tend to get out of control i mean in, in lucha libre a lot of times the guys tend to like take off part of their uniform or, or part of their their gear and start whipping each other with their belts and you, at that point you've pretty much you know they've lost all respect for you as an official and you've lost all respect to the fans and it's just been all tossed out at that point you know and i, I absolutely hate when they start doing that but um as far as like the role changing you know it really shouldn't um if anything if things have started to get out a little a little out of control i think my role would change but I, I would go the opposite direction and actually start being a little more serious i mean i think there are some times i, I can't really you know lay down any specific matches or anything but where guys have started getting out of control and then i legit start getting pissed and kind of put them in their place and <laughs> thankfully and this comes through 20 years of experience, I guess they tend to listen to me and respect me a little more than I know they do a lot of other officials and they, I just mean wrestlers in general. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a lot of guys know I've been around a long time and, and they, they know that, you know, they don't want to have the rap of being the guy who punched out Rick Knox or something, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it, thankfully it, it's never really nothing like that's ever really happened. And, and most of the time, no one's going to let that happen either, thankfully. So, right. yeah, I mean, it, but definitely, yeah, your, your role could definitely change going from part of the show to being a protector of, of the participants. I mean, a lot of times when the crowds are getting rowdy and out of control, I feel I'm no longer there as a referee for the matches. I am a bodyguard for the wrestlers, especially if they spill out into the audience yeah. and you get one of those particularly hostile type of crowds, which – Thankfully, wrestling is not really like that so much anymore. But early on in my career, there used to be a lot of scary situations where, mm. you know, it was like, okay, guys, let's just go to the back. Don't even worry about going to the finishing the match. Just oh, go to the dresser, you know, because the crowd is getting a little too crazy. And if you stay out there long, they're going to come after you. So, uh, and anytime the wrestlers start brawling in the crowd, I'm always kind of just watching the audience more than I am the wrestlers. They're going to take care of themselves. They're not. The, the issue it's some fan who's gonna pull out a knife or do something stupid and thankfully i've never really had to deal with a, a bad issue like that thank god thank wow. god 100 percent. thank god <laughs> oh my um so before being officially signed by AEW full-time you refereed a lot throughout the independent circuit was there a favorite company that you liked working for um favorite company i mean there's been so many and some of them were really fun and some of them come some of them go some of them mm -hmm. honestly i probably don't even remember <laughs> um but like the ones that st the ones that stick out obviously are lucha underground mm -hmm. uh pwg mm -hmm. and uh wrestling society x which was the old show we did for mm -hmm. mtv that, that we we taped that entire run in like a week's time and wow. it was just the most fun weeks I ever had in wrestling, uh, taping that show. Uh, but Lucha Underground, very much the same way, um, just because we finally had a show that was being created by a network that at the time seemed to have unlimited money, mm -hmm. uh, and was able to do whatever they wanted, and they treated us like royalty, and, and the show was fantastic when it was done. I mean, we were all into Lucha Underground. PWG is a totally different vibe than any other in company i worked for maybe because of how long they've been around and they were kind of one of the first super feds so to speak that pulled in talent from both coasts hmm. and really put on all-star shows without the benefits of storylines and, and all that stuff uh and you know the fact that they're still going gosh what is this six, six we just hit our 16 year yeah. anniversary uh hi hmm. uh, um, those shows are always fun because everybody wants to go there. Every, everyone across the country, you know, I, I constantly get, hey, man, how can I get to PWG? How can I get on a PWG card? Uh, and, and there's a reason they all want to be there because they know it, it's a fun, great time. The audience is unlike anything else and the locker room. is The, the talent level is just, just amazing. You have to pinch yourself sometimes looking <laughs> around. The, but, 
Uh, and there's another local uh, promotion out here that's, that runs out of Long Beach, California, PCW Ultra. Yep. That's another really, really fun promotion. I mean, they're big shows. They're very professional, well done. They bring in big names, some of the best talent across the country. They're, they're an absolute blast. Uh, uh, th- those are probably be my four that I would say are my, my all-time favorite ones, aside from AEW, obviously. Yeah, that's awesome. I've, I'm, I've been watching PWG for a while now, too. And it's funny you mentioned that last one because i actually seen – a couple of clips uh, not too recently on uh, or not too long ago on Twitter. Uh, it definitely looks really, really good. Um, yeah, it's good, good stuff on there. They're mm-hmm. awesome. Um, so uh, we'll go into another fan tweet here, and it kind of ties into a little bit at the beginning of the last question. So uh, take us through that moment that you first got asked or got asked and signed to AEW. What sort of emotions were going through your head, and did you see it coming at all? Well, a little bit. I mean, <laughs> you know, we had been in discussion on it, honestly. I mean, I was told um, at All In Weekend, Labor oh, wow. Day of last year, by Matt and Nick that something was coming. Hold on. This is going to be big, and we want you to be part of it. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm in. I'm, you know, and then, you know, months would go by with nothing, or you'd hear a little bit of a, a, a tidbit here or there. And then I actually did talk with Matt uh I don't know, a month or so previous to that bar wrestling show. Mm. And he told me that, you know, Hey, we're, we're getting close, you know, keep, keep it on. We're going to start signing people and start making announcements and just hang in there. And, um, you know, we, we never talked money or anything, but he basically, had, you know, made promises to me that, uh, that I, I would be able to, to quit my day job, all that good stuff. Mm. And so again, just kind of holding out, Hope, you know, hope that, Hey man, any day it, it, it's going to happen. So in hindsight, I kind of should have seen it coming, I think, because <laughs> they asked me if I was going to be at the bar wrestling show, like that week, Hey, you're going to be a bar this week. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to be there. Like, okay, cool. We're going to be there. We're going to be filming for some stuff or being the elite. And, uh, the way they had kind of presented it to me was they were going to film the presentation of them giving Joey, Ryan a, a, a contract offer oh. so that was kind of how it all played out going in that day and so awesome. I, and again in hindsight I, I should have seen it coming because <laughs> I thought it was kind of weird that they wanted me in the ring for that and then they actually told me where they wanted me to stand you know while they were going to do this whole thing with Joey which I don't know why they cared I thought it was odd but the whole thing was they were going to turn towards the entrance to the locker room and not be looking at the locker room they were going to be looking at me and they made the announcement that they were going to offer me the contract. And I mean, even talking about it right now, I'm getting kind of choked up and getting goosebumps because really, really uh, insane moment, not just from the way that the bucks treated me, but the way that the fans responded. Uh, it, it was a genuine moment it was a hundred percent genuine. And uh, I mean, we finalized everything obviously after that, but that moment is uh definitely something i'll never forget i don't think the people that witnessed it will ever forget it either because they knew at the time that it was a genuine moment it it was it was incredible yeah i remember watching it on being the elite and i remember we did we did an episode on the i think soon after that and we did we do being the elite reviews on our uh our podcast i remember talking to tiff and going like man like i could feel the emotions from that scene that they put in there like that was I was getting like goosebumps and chills myself watching it. That was, that was, that was really cool and really good moment. Can you imagine what you were feeling? I think we feel like that with a lot of the stuff that we watch on being the elite that we get like goosebumps and we get so excited for all you guys. It's it's nuts. Yeah, it's, It's so neat because in a way, like as you're watching being the elite, you're watching this whole story unfold and you're seeing these kids who grow up together suddenly get these great opportunities and, and then presenting opportunities to people they've worked with and grown up with as well. And it's, it's just feel good all the way around. So yeah, I'm, I'm totally on board with that. So exciting. Oh. And uh, that last uh, fan tweet was from our friend Zachary fan of the podcast. I forgot to mention that. So shout out to you, Zach. Thank you. Zachary, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so we do have another fan tweet. We mixed a bunch into our, our questions that we have. So this is from our friend Anthony from Smart to Death. Uh, what's it like being a ref on a YouTube series? Who comes up with the bits? Um, actually, part of the fun of the whole BTE thing is that a lot of it is spontaneous. A lot of it is planned out as well, but as 
far as the, the in particular the referee bits, uh, the referee twenty four seven bits, the Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus stuff, all that. <laughs> we, we all kind of pitch ideas for that. We really do. Um, some of the stuff have been ideas of mine. Sometimes it's Brandon Cutler who comes up with it. Uh, sometimes it's Matt and Nick. It, it literally comes from all directions, and and you know we film a lot of stuff, and a lot of times uh, there's just a ton of footage that doesn't even make it to BTE uh, due to the time constraint and everything. But um, yeah, they film a lot of stuff and, and it's a lot of, you know, throwing spaghetti on the wall and seeing what's going <laughs> to stick and what's going to be fun and look good. And if it is, they, they'll run with it, you know? So, uh, and I have a thing, I have a feeling that a lot of um, the AEW broadcasts are going to be like that. Not the same funny tone as being the elite, but there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, trying new stuff and, and experimenting, I think, to, to see what's going to work. I think you can definitely tell that a lot of stuff is uh, a little unscripted or just done on the spot. Oh. And I think that's what makes the YouTube series that good. <laughs> it really is. It really is. I mean, the, the spontaneous stuff has been some of the best stuff. Uh, and, and none of it's really rehearsed. We, we never rehearse it. Um, you know, we might do a take and be like, okay, we didn't, couldn't hear you that good. Or, or, you know, we need to do it again. You know, then there might be a second take, but, but overall, yeah, there's no, no rehearsing the spontaneity and the improvisation is part of what puts it over. I think. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so, uh, in terms of you refing, uh, what has, has there been a favorite match of yours that you've refereed so far? Kind of a, loaded question <laughs> so, so many you know yeah. i mean it, it's incredibly hard i can't even remember the matches i did last weekend <laughs> but i mean there, there's you know i i always just because i remember being asked the question several times i mean i'm always partial to the uh, uh i mean as, as, as a referee growing up and a fan growing up in the 80s you are i was always a big fan of the nwa and the nwa world championship mm. having got to referee a couple of nwa title switches was pretty cool i think the very nice. first one with adam pierce losing the title to colt cabana uh, i'll never forget it uh mm. the emotion in in that match and the emotion in the building was just off the charts and and uh when Colt, you know, won. It was just, just fantastic. And, uh, uh, something I'm kind of proud of and, and pr proud to have been a part of. Um, but you know, the one, one that kind of stands out to me that when I bring this topic up, isn't so much a match that was great. Like, you know, it was all, it was awesome. It was fantastic. I mean, this match was, but the match I'm talking about was the six man tag at last year's all in in Chicago. Mm. Um, this was the one with the Young Bucks and um, Kota Ibushi, I believe, against, oh gosh, was it Rey Mysterio and Phoenix and, uh, and oh my God. Lita or Pito? Gosh, now even I'm blanking out on who it was. <laughs> but in all reality, all I remember was that we went out there with basically 23 minute match planned and we got in the ring and they told me over the earpiece that. Uh, pay-per-view feed is going to cut and we have between eight and nine minutes to do the match. Wow. And uh, so I was basically in a position where I had to tell six guys, three different languages that oh we had to really <laughs> truncate our match entirely and throw a lot of stuff out and go right to this and improvise that. And, mm -hmm. and so, I mean, if you go back and watch that match the whole time, I'm just screaming and yelling at these guys because they're <laughs> the whole time saying you know you've got six minutes you've got five minutes you've got four minutes and you know i mean these guys had this match pretty well planned out and it was going to take every bit of 23 minutes and so to for us to communicate that to the to the boys and for them to perform at that level the way they did and to trim that match the way they did we hit the one two three and i raised their arm and we lost the pay-per-view feed like three or four seconds later i mean we made it by the skin of our teeth and uh, you know we were kind of laughing about it afterwards saying my goodness had had that had we gone off the air with that match still going we would have been the laughing stock of wrestling i mean who knows how this whole thing would have turned out but um we pulled it off. I mean, we got back to the dressing room full of cheers and applause because everyone knew what we were up against <laughs> out there and what was going on. And, uh, man, we pulled it off. It's it still, when I think about it, I, I, I think it was one of the most rewarding and most fun times of my life, but it was definitely the most stressful match that I was ever part of. Uh, so that's 
definitely one of the more memorable matches in I my remember career. Now it was Ben Bandito. That was the other guy. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I remember now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> so, uh, me and Kyle watched it together in April because Kyle is in Canada and I live in New York. So Kyle is here. We're like, let's watch all in together. <laughs> so oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I think you can watch it on YouTube now. Someone told me oh, that yeah. you know ROH that you can watch I, it on YouTube. I think that's what we did, right, Kyle? Yeah, I think I'm pretty sure I found it on YouTube. <laughs> That's awesome. Awesome. Um, so, time for some fantasy booking. Is there a match that you would uh, that you would fa- fantasy book that you would like to officiate? Uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't really entertain that a lot. As mm. far as oh, wow, you know, what would be great or fantasy card? I mean, as a as a as a fan and as a referee, my my dream match would probably be to go back in time and and referee Flair and Steamboat or. Mm. or Steam- you know, something like that. Uh, I love that. Those, the types of matches at the time, you know, the, those were groundbreaking matches, the pace they were going, all the near falls. I mean, now that's the prototype of a, pretty much a typical indie wrestling match. But uh, when those matches happened back in 1987, 1989, it, it, it basically uh, was an eye-opener for a lot of wrestling fans that, right. um, hey, if these guys do – maybe put a little thought in their matches and plan out some spots the the uh, length that they can go to and uh, yeah th- those those matches are just fantastic and i wish i could i wish i could have been a part of those i guess nice. but as far as nowadays you know it's I, just not really i really don't even entertain that so i'm sorry that's kind of a lackluster <laughs> no, no, that no, no. We, we like it no, it's no, but i'm sure you look spiffy in one of those long uh long sleeve dress shirts with the bow tie the, the old school referee look. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we know you've refereed a lot of the Young Bucks matches. That's uh, that's uh, well known. That's out there. And I know there's been sometimes there's been some controversial endings. There's a history of that. Uh, how but how has it been refereeing the two brothers there? And uh, is there a moment that sticks out to you the most from your past history with them? Yeah, there's probably a couple. I mean, obviously, there's, you know, the big contract signing. Uh, that's a, a big deal. But I would, if I think back, I mean, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the first kind of spot we ever did together uh, was a, was pretty unexpected at the time. Um, I think they, if it was a PWG, and, a, and I believe they, I know they were wrestling Paul London. I can't remember who Paul's partner was. It was probably El Generico, maybe. And oh I, I just remember it was Paul Lennon because it was at the time he was walking around with a bullhorn or a megaphone. <laughs> and at one point, they used the Bucks used the megaphone on Paul and hit him in the head with it. And I remember grabbing the megaphone. I was supposed to yell through the megaphone at the Young Bucks, but they had knocked the batteries out of it or something. <laughs> so it didn't work. I ended up like just tossing it out of the ring and kind of yelling at him. And I remember Matt slapped my face so hard oh he God. left the five fingerprints. It was for like three three days afterwards. You could see the handprint on my face. Oh God! And whipped me into the did the double whip in the ropes, and I you know ducked their clothesline, came back with a big double clothesline, and the the place just erupted and and uh generico i think might have grabbed him and hit his mover and that might have even been the finish of the match but i remember it was just incredible uh pop and i think that was what really might have started the whole thing with me and the young bucks Mm -hmm. um there was also uh uh the three-way ladder match that was pretty fun that was them versus um Let's see if I can remember this one now. <laughs> you were right I with El Generico. That was that was correct. <laughs> Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly, I believe, and the Super Smash Brothers. Those were the three teams, and it was a ladder match in PWG. And this was the one where Nick hit me in the head with the ladder and cracked my head open, and I ended up coming back out later and pushing him off and doing the big dive and all that. And, I remember that. Uh, that was another moment that was just off the charts and, the, and was just so much fun. Uh, but another time that was really cool, too, that I, I kind of think of is uh, Brian Kendrick, uh, Spanky, had uh, ran <laughs> shows, still runs shows, actually, out here under the name of WPW, Wrestling Pro Wrestling, out here in L.A. Oh. But uh, a few years back, he did a show called the King of Flight Tournament, and it was like an indie tournament of high flyers. Uh, Ricochet was on it. Uh Rich Swan was on it. Oh. Um, and Matt and Nick, I believe, were both on it as singles guys. 
And we were playing off our stuff at PWG at the time. And I remember we did some sort of a shenanigan finish where they did the, the brother switch. You know, Nick ran out. Matt came in while I was distracted. But he ended up getting pinned by Rich Swan, And I counted one, two, three, you know. So the illegal brother lost, but I gave <laughs> Matt to Swan. They, of course, ran in the ring and attacked me. And, you know, I think we duplicated the clothesline spot or something but uh, it was another really fun fun moment and i remember the crowd just popped so huge for it because no one was expecting it and it was a little <laughs> nice to all the pwg faithful and all that so that was another cool moment to get a chance look that thing up the king of flight tournament it was okay. really well done and the, the dvd came out really really good and it's a shame that it didn't turn into something bigger for brian oh wow yeah, we'll definitely have to check that out after this for sure definitely um, so we have another fan tweet from Good Guy Dave. What has been the scariest moment of your career in terms of spots you've seen from other wrestlers? Moments that made you catch your breath and go, wow, this guy or woman's still alive. Wow. Uh, well, <laughs> right off the top of my head, I can think of just, you know, the other week, the ladder match it all out. There were a couple of very scary bumps that both Matt and Nick took. And, and I'm not talking about like the Canadian destroyer, the spots, th those are all okay. Mm -hmm. But there were a couple times where I think each one got pushed off a ladder towards the ropes and, you know, the gravity and the momentum wasn't quite there. So they lost their footing and, and it potentially the way they both fell it wasn't at the same time it was two separate instances but they both took bad tumbles out of the ring through tables and uh i remember just you know my heart stops when i see that stuff uh but you know or, or anytime you see darby allen do any of those crazy bumps oh, uh those back drops from the top of the post to the apron or you know the steps like he did the other night i mean mm -hmm. that's another heart stopper um a scary one uh, when we were shooting Lucha Underground, um, I'm assuming it was probably season two, uh, Jeff Cobb was wrestling Rey Mysterio. Jeff Cobb was wrestling as the character Matanza. Okay. Uh, we're doing some sort of a hardcore match, him and Rey Mysterio, and they were brawling all over the, the temple, you know, all over the building, and they went up to this top level, and there was a, they were backed up against some panes of glass because it was an old factory building, you know, abandoned place. And... Uh, I remember Jeff wanted to punch his hand through the, the pane of glass and I was kind of like, yeah, that's not a good idea. So, no, it'll be fine, you know. And like it, it's, we all kind of said, okay, and uh, let him do it. And of course, he sliced an artery and blood started pumping out. I mean, with his heartbeat, you could see it squirting out. I mean, I'm, I, it was squirting out several feet. Uh, and we were up top on, uh, you know, the second level where the balconies were. And, uh, I mean, he was losing a lot of blood and he was losing a lot of blood quick, uh, every second. We knew that if we did not get him down stairs quickly, we would never get him downstairs because he is a big guy. And, uh, by the time we got enough big guys up there to lift him and get him down, he probably would have bled out. It was that bad. Wow. Uh, quickly shut down productions and all the fans out of there, uh, we closed it all up. He got taken care of, thank God, and, uh, you know, got sent to the emergency room. Luckily, and I know through experience, the emergency room was very, very close to where we, uh, uh, the hospital was very close to where we were shooting uh, that show. And, um, you know, he got taken care of, but we basically had to put that entire episode slash match on hold. And I think when we came back from a hiatus three or four months later, we had to reshoot that entire match because of that. Wow. But, yeah, that was a very, very scary incident. Um, oh my. Could, he definitely could, could have died. It was scary. That's <laughs> – yeah, that would probably scare me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's – oh, wow. And then I guess there was that uh, match recently at GCW. It just happened a couple oh, nights yeah. ago where uh, – what's the guy's name? G. Rave or something like oh, that. Cut yeah. it out. Scary stuff, man. I mean, it's – you know, they call it death match for a reason, but mm -hmm. it's hopefully nothing we ever see. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, scary. I, thank God he at least got taken care of. Yeah, I cringed hard when you brought up Darby Allen. When that spot he'd used with the cracker barrel, I, I'm i like, oh, oh, I cringe. I'm like, I could feel my back hurting from yeah. that spot. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I the way his head snapping back on that, it's it's not, not good. And, and, you know, thankfully, I mean, these guys are kind of going nuts on the pay-per-views, the AEW pay-per-views here. Mm -hmm. Uh, they know once, you know, we get to, to weekly TV, we're, we're not going to be doing that. They're not going to have right. to do that. Um, they're not going to be expected to do that. Right. 
and uh, hopefully they don't try to do that. But, um, you know, yeah, that that was a little above and beyond, in my opinion, watching that. Every time they showed the replay, I'm like, man, I hope this doesn't end up being like the last Darby Allen match or something. But I guess he's fine. Apparently he's okay. <laughs> he's nuts. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think Tess met him a few times. He's oh, he's crazy. I've seen him a bunch of times here in New York, and he, I've been a fan. He's such a nice guy. He's so is. soft spoken and friendly. Him and, and Priscilla yes. Kelly too. That you would you know never <laughs> never guess how psychotic they are. <laughs> <laughs> They're so awesome. <laughs> They're so awesome. I was excited when uh, he got signed like big time. Like Kyle wasn't familiar and. I like messaged Kyle when it came out that he was signed, and I was like, "Oh my god!" And he's like, "I don't know who this guy is." I was like, oh, "He's so good." <laughs> so I was yeah, really he's, he's a lot of fun. He's really cool. We've become pretty good friends over the last year or so, and and uh, yeah, I, I really like him. That's awesome. Good. Um, so uh, we'll stay on the topic of uh, kind of like incidents here, and there was something that happened not too long ago involving a referee and a professional wrestler where the ref wrestler was seen in the video obviously taking it too far and assaulting the referee on the outside. Um, what do you know of this situation? What was your reaction, being the official yourself, when you've seen this? I'm sure you've seen the footage of this. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I was pretty shocked when I saw that. And I think um, not just as a referee, but as a wrestling person in general, it was pretty shocking. And I think the outrage is is universal it's not just like the referees are saying oh this is ha bad that this happened to one of ours it, it ev everyone knows that this was uh across the line i mean i got mm -hmm. a lot of messages and i saw a lot of tweets and, and stuff from from wrestlers uh condemning uh the actions of this guy and uh you know it's pretty crappy i mean and and the worst thing is just like another wrestler as a referee, you're putting your mm -hmm. well-being in their hands. You, you know, you're putting your, you're, you're let, you're trusting them with your well-being. You're trusting them with your li uh, livelihood. And, you know, when I watch the footage, you know, there's a lot of guys, there's a lot of armchair quarterbacks out there who are yeah. saying, oh, I would have done this or I would have done that. And a lot of, a lot of referees are saying the same thing. Well, you know, I was taught how to defend myself and, and that's true, but a lot, something like that's happening. First off, it's it's such a shock to your system because you're like trying to process mm -hmm. it. Am I being attacked exactly. here? What, what is happening? You know, the, is someone really really beating me up? Are they working and just is, are they going getting out of control, or or is this really coming from a malicious place? Um, you know, I, I kind of go back again to, to my tenure and having done this so long, I, I think I'm safe that nothing like that would ever happen to me. No one would ever try to cross that line. I think I have enough friends who would stick up for <laughs> you know, realize what we'll was going on. We'll stick up for you. We'll, we'll get you, it. Back. <laughs> you know, I'm no big, fat, tough guy, but I swear, I don't care who it is. You know, you, you start doing something like that. If I catch on to what's happening, it, it's going to end up bad for you. And I'm not saying I'm going to knock you out or going to take you down or something but guarantee you'll get out of it looking pretty bad too and it's not going to look good that a referee bloodied your nose or, or did something you know and and, and yeah you might kill me <laughs> but it, it ain't going to be easy mm -hmm. but you know that's part of the problem is like you know you're, you're putting your trust in these guys and this whole thing's happening and you're wondering what the hell why what is this you know next thing you know it's kind of over and you're like what the hell just happened you know and my, I can't imagine having something like that happen to me and, and, or anyone I know. Uh, I honestly don't know how I would have reacted and, and, but he definitely crossed the line and any, any condemnation that he receives as a result is well-deserved in my opinion. Hopefully the guy is not booked anywhere ever again. Yeah. There's definitely, uh, uh, no excuse for that. That was, that was I don't care how mad you are what's happened in the situation in the match and the whole thing was a result of mm -hmm. of you know the guy not kicking out in time so I I, I didn't see the footage of the three count yeah. but even if the referee screwed up and, and erroneously made a three count nothing deserved that yeah. that's bottom line exactly. you know you can still be a heel and maintain your heat by losing and, and you know get over it it's you know, it, it, as much as I respect wrestling and it, it's my livelihood now and, and as big of a fan as I am through all the years, I have no illusions about it. We're grown men in trunks play fighting with each other. And if you think it's anything other than that, 
you know, I, I get the mentality that it's, that, you know, it's, it's a true sport and we're athletes and I'm on board with that, but it is a show. And once you cross that line and make it about, you know, you making a personal statement, that's called going into business for yourself. And that's not received very well in the wrestling industry. Yeah. Right. Um, so, um, uh... What do you think of some people in the community who are comparing AEW to WCW and not believing that it will follow suit and I'm fail leaving. in the same? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> leave me <with> my bad. <laughs> you know, I I don't really see where. I mean, I I get the comparisons. I really do. Um, I mean, from my understanding, uh, Tony Khan was a a big WCW fan, and he kind of wanted to, you know, kind of you know. AEW was originally going to have some sort of a play on the WCW letters or, or is going to be W E W something like that. Cause he, he was such a fan of the old product. He wanted to pay tribute to it in the name. And uh, the bucks and Kenny were like, well, you know, they, they were very adamant that the word elite needed to be in there. And so they, they kind of, you know, came up with AEW, but you know, long story short, that's really where the comparisons end. I think, um, you know, everyone says, well, you know, WCW had, had money, but you know, they didn't have a passionate owner. They had a businessman owner and Tony and his father, yeah, they're businessmen, but you know, Tony is extremely passionate about wrestling. So oh, yeah. this is his baby. He wants yeah. it to succeed. He's not in this to make money. He's not in this to generate uh, a fortune or a, a wrestling empire. He's doing it because he legitimately thinks that there's room for another better alternative product out there in pro wrestling. And, uh, you know, the fact that we're on a Turner station, I think, is, again, maybe a result of hard work of Tony and those guys wanting that that WCW familiarity. But, I mean, that's really where it ends. I mean, you know, I don't see us being swallowed up or bought out by WWE. I don't see us. Uh, hiring people just for the sake of hiring them, sending, letting them sit at home, which were some of the financial issues that was plaguing WCW at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not run like that. This is a much different company than WCW as far as the way the finances are run and the talent is handled and the personnel is handled. Exactly. Uh, so the comparisons that it's going to be just like WCW pretty much just comes from smart marks who just yeah. like – <laughs> letters out i think exactly and you said it best there uh right in the beginning of that the big difference between tony khan running it and ted turner running it was ted turner seeing it as a business thing and a business venture as to where tony khan yeah. he is so passionate about the wrestling business you can tell in his interviews he's done so far and ever since he's come into this aw business he loves professional wrestling and wants to put all his passion into it and that's what's going to differentiate the uh, AEW from the rest of the uh, quote unquote competition out there. It's going to be amazing. Basically <laughs> his speech. Yeah. After. Yeah. I mean, and, and I know, um, you know, as far as some, some of the differences, you know, one of the things that, you know, we want to talk about probably what, what's going to set AEW apart. Um, you, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's an exciting time for wrestling, that's for sure, with, with AEW, NXT, and now Impact coming to access. I mean, things are really picking up for wrestling fans. It's getting to another one of those golden eras. Mm -hmm. But as far as, like, what's the big question, what's the difference? And I get asked all the time, you know, what's different about your show than WWE? Um, I kind of point to a few different things. One of them, uh, there's no no writing staff. There is no scripting at all. Um you know, WWE has layers of writing staff that everything has to be cleared through and gone through and rewrites and changes. And literally up until seconds before these guys <laughs> go on screen, their exactly. stuff is rewritten. I don't know, you know what happens. Someone through that week after week, I don't know. But um, we don't have to deal with that, thankfully. Mm -hmm. uh, our mentality is let, let them wrestle. Let them go out there and do what they do best, which mm -hmm. is wrestle. If there's guys who are good at cutting promos, they're going to let them cut promos. None of that stuff is scripted out either. Mm -hmm. um, I think WWE listening to the fans and giving the fans what they want to some degree was a bit of lip service just to say, hey, we're listening, but we're still going to kind of do our thing. And mm -hmm. uh, 
I think you're going to see that AW really is a little more involved with the fan base and what they expect and what they want. Um, Oh yeah, we've seen I, it so far with like yeah. with Nick and Matt too. Like they, it's almost seems like they want to know what we like to transition it onto TV and what we've kind of seen that already with the pay per view so far. Yeah, and I mean, and that doesn't mean that you know, oh, pick your favorite guy and he'll be champion forever. You know, mm-hmm. no, that right. people want are compelling matches and great stories and 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 fantastic athleticism and uh, you're going to see a lot of new new talent pushed right out of the gate on national TV as opposed to toiling in an undercard or a developmental system. I mean, granted, NXT is you know, now practically considered a third brand, almost on equal footing as Raw and SmackDown, and, and talent-wise it is probably superior, if, if not equal. Uh, but uh, you're, you're not going to see you know guys going through getting signed and then not – hearing anything about them for 18 months or two years before they finally get pulled up to the main roster. You're going to see a lot of new guys get pushed right out of the gate. And I think that's going to be exciting uh, for fans and for potential wrestlers um, seeking new opportunities. And plus another thing, and this is huge. The thing that I think that's really going to set W uh, AEW apart from WWE is um, our schedule. Uh, you're going to see guys, I think, perform at a higher level on a more consistent basis because we are not going to be on the road with the consistency or a hard schedule like WWE has. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're looking at basically weekly TV and quarterly pay-per-views, and that will be it for us, at least for the first year or two. Uh, You know, maybe then things, the the brand will start growing. We might start doing house shows. But this, Mm -hmm. you know, schedule of being on the road, 300 days a year, uh, night in, night out. Uh, you know, we're, we're not experiencing that. We don't have to see for that, thankfully. Yeah. And that's going to show at some point that that will reflect in, in the product and the way that we're doing things. Yeah, we talk about it all the time here on the show that we, we've we heard all the rumblings and, like, the the, the scheduling of what AW is going to do. And it's we, we love that. I think it helps the pay-per-views there's a bigger build towards the pay-per-views you're not just having a pay-per-view and then three weeks later is another one right away like you don't have the time to build with them aw doing quarterly pay-per-views there's so much time for you to build a storyline and the payoff to that next pay-per-view is just so much better with that amount of time in, in between so yeah absolutely i, I mean it's, it's an old formula but it's a proven formula and and as we get established that's what how we'll do it so and yeah uh you know being on uh, the end of, of part of the crew and all that. I mean, I, I think it's fantastic. I mean, I'm still pretty much home every weekend. It's phenomenal. That's awesome. That's so awesome. Um, so speaking of the whole situation on Wednesday nights, uh, it's being labeled now as the uh, quote unquote Wednesday night wars. Uh, NXT <laughs> is going to be going head to head live on Wednesdays. Uh, with A&W, uh, uh, NXT being on USA Network, AW being obviously on TNT. Uh, we want to know, what are your thoughts on the whole situation of them going head-to-head on Wednesdays? Well, I mean, it, it's kind of funny. Um, it, if, if you listen to the stuff that's coming out of Triple H and WWE, and it, it's maybe not so much Triple H, but WWE in general is that, uh, you know, AEW is not a threat. Who are these guys? Not even worried mm-hmm. about them. Uh, that's so not the case. I mean, I, everyone, you know, every action they take dictates otherwise. So, I mean, no sooner is AEW announced is going on Wednesday than NXT's debuting on Wednesday nights head to head. I mean, you know, at the, when I first heard about it, I was kind of like, really, you know, but now thinking about it, it's almost like I'm starting to get excited about it because, you know, I remember, uh, back in, you know, 96, 97, 98, whatever it was, just mm-hmm. being really, really thrilled on, on Monday nights, uh, literally flicking channel back and forth, back and forth, commercial, <laughs> back to the other, back to the other one, you know? Uh, and then, you know, out here on the West Coast, thankfully, I think uh, uh, the TNT stuff, I would we would get like on a feed later, again, three hours later. So you saw it live at five o'clock and then it came on again later at eight or something. I can't remember exactly. Mm-hmm. You were able to watch it, but uh, it, it was it was awesome. It really it, it made everyone step their game up. I think that's why it was such an exciting time in wrestling. Not just because oh these two companies were on at the same time. No. They were on at the same time and they were kicking ass. They were both doing some amazing stuff. 
and uh, they've been chasing that smoke of the Monday Night Wars. They, being just the wrestling industry in general, has been chasing the smoke of the Monday Night Wars ever since. We haven't got anything quite close to that level of popularity and excitement, mm-hmm. and uh, on the cusp of it again, it's really cool, I think. Yeah, I think that you know, there's a big difference from today to from back then. Uh, streaming and access to streaming afterward has been so much more accessible in, in today's world that I think WB kind of made this the little mistake of letting people know that NXT is going to be put on the network the ne- very next day on Thursdays. So I think they kind of yeah. shot themselves a little bit in the foot there where someone who is a fan of both can be like, okay, then I'll just tune into AW live on Wednesdays and watch the replay of NXT the very next day. And then in all reality, I mean, everyone's got DVRs on their cable boxes yep, if exactly. they got cable. It's it, it, it's not going to really stop anyone from watching one show either way, I don't mm-hmm. think. And and hardcore wrestling fans are going to watch them both regardless. Oh, yeah. I, it, yeah. It seems to me, I mean, I guess it's true, but it seems it befuddles me that there might actually be people out there who only watch one or will only watch one and not the other. Right. It's all going to be wrestling. Some is going to be enjoyable, some of it not. You're, you know, it doesn't matter what mm-hmm. banner it's under. As long as you're enjoying it, watch it. What the hell? Exactly. Right. Exactly. And that's why we're on the full AEW train. <laughs> Me and Tiff, as soon as this started, we're like, we're all aboard. Even after double or nothing, like, okay, let's go. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, full, I'm full, like, I'm full gear, pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, so what do you think an AEW is going to make wrestling fans out there go, hey, now that's different, and I want to tune into that and differentiate. Can't talk themselves from the competition that's out there. I'm I'm sorry. What was the question? I don't quite. <laughs> okay, so pretty much like, what do you think? Um, in in AEW is going to make wrestling fans out there go, hey, now that's different. That's going to make them tune in for it. That's going to make it completely uh, different than anything else. Well, hopefully, um. Number one, when it comes to the wrestling action, I think that's going to be a big thing that's going to make us make fans turn in tune into that. Um, you know, with I mean, yeah, AEW's got agents and match agents stuff like that, mm-hmm. but overall, these guys are doing the matches the way they want to do them, and we all know that that's not necessarily the case at mm-hmm. WWE. Um, I'm thinking of a recent. Uh, interview that I read um, a clip of uh, with TJ Perkins. And I don't know if you watch TJ a lot. I mean, I've known him since he was a kid. I think I refereed his first ever match when he was like 13 or 14 years old. He's phenomenal. He is just a complete technician. He's, he's just a, a wrestling machine. And you probably wouldn't really know that if you watched what he does on WWE, because, mm-hmm. you know, he would, you know, want to get out there and do his thing. And suddenly he'd be told by the referee, you know, who's being told by the back that, uh, slow this down, put him in a chin lock, put your face up and stare at the camera because the commentators are talking about Brock Lesnar or whatever else is going on, you know, and they don't want all the action going on to distract from what the commentators talking about. Right. We, we're, we're not going to have that dynamic. You know, it's going to be about the wrestlers that are on TV doing their thing and doing, doing it the way they want to. Now, obviously there's going to be guys who are going to look at what they're going to do and say, okay, yeah, that doesn't make sense. Let's peel this back. Let's add this in. Let's take that out. That's all part of the deal. But overall, these guys are doing it the way they want to. And it's going to show. It's going to make a big difference in the finished product. And that, I think, is a big part of what's going to make people uh, tune in. Uh, Plus, just fresh faces, fresh wrestlers. I mean, when you got guys like Jungle Boy, uh, MJF, uh, Luchasaurus, the SCU, you know, uh, the Lucha Brothers, the Young Bucks. I mean, just naming these guys off my head, I'm like, wow, these are exciting mm-hmm. guys. They're a lot more exciting than a lot of the cookie cutter, bearded guys who are coming out of the WWE machine right now. You know, they who are all great, fantastic athletes and great wrestling talents, but they're being molded into a particular type of wrestler, and they all kind of look mm-hmm. the same and act the same, right. and it's a little bit boring in my opinion and you're not going to have that in AEW it's going to be a a roster of individuals and unique personalities and uh it's just going to bloom like a big flower man can't wait it's fun it's crazy you said the thing about TJP I can already give you a prime example of someone currently in WWE that you don't you've seen different a lot of people have seen different 
and other companies on the independent circuit, and that's Ricochet. He's not looked like the same Ricochet that I remember watching before he even stepped foot into the World Wrestling Entertainment. I remember a completely different, more of a high flying. Even when he was Prince Puma, like I remember a completely different Ricochet than what I'm seeing. The Prince Puma stuff. Yeah. It's a it's a world of difference. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So, uh, is there someone in the AEW roster currently, or maybe even an independent star you know of in the back of your head that you th- and uh, AEW may have their eye on that you think is going to be a big up and coming star? Uh, we'll kind of like transition maybe mainly towards AEW since we're on that subject. Do you think there's someone currently on the roster that's going to be the next big thing in wrestling? Yeah. Um, I'm really big on MJF, Maxwell, <laughs> Jake Friedman. I think he's he's got the package. He's entertaining. He's a solid wrestler, good fundamentals, great look. Uh, and and he's, he's really fun to be around. And I think he's, uh, uh, he's someone who's going to – start to grow into a, a main event caliber type of, of guy. So Such his star is such a good heel. Oh, he's fantastic. He's... Um, Luchasaurus is another one who really seems to be blooming. I mean, I don't think anyone anticipated how popular, how over he was going to be. Oh my God. Uh, Crazy. He's, he's really blowing up. I mean, just the BTE stuff alone. Oh, and yeah. then uh, the, the match it, it, it all out. Uh, really got a lot of praise, and uh, I expect a lot of a lot of good things from him coming up as well. It's so funny because a lot of these guys I remember seeing here because I live in New York, so I'm fortunate enough to have a lot of indie wrestling here. Um, so I remember MJF like 18 years old and like being wow. in SWA and like me heckling the hell out of him. So I like had that great appreciate even Darby. Like these guys, like I appreciate so much coming from the indies. So me personally, I'm so excited to see where AEW is going because the a private party, House of Glory, like I've always got a House yeah. of Glory. Like it's just, oh my God, I'm so excited. You've seen them grow up. You're like, you've, you've watched them. We're so happy for them getting signed and, and being part of this, uh, you know, and the fact that they're in the, the upcoming tag team tournament for mm-hmm. the, for the t- titles is just awesome. Uh, I, I love private party. Oh my God. Um, but you know, um, as far as I guess outside of uh, uh, AEW, a couple guys on the Indies who I would maybe shout out. Uh, uh, there's a guy out here on the West Coast who's really making a name for himself, and he's getting flown around the country by the name of Jake Atlas. Yes, um, yes, yeah, I've heard of yeah, him. Yeah, fairly over two years in, mm-hmm. you know, and, and he's just phenomenal. Just, just such a good guy, such a big heart, and hard worker, and fantastic athlete, great wrestler. And, yeah, it's really good to see him getting the recognition and the play. I mean, I know he's been going to AAW in Chicago. He's he's getting uh, uh, a lot of recognition, and, and uh, ho- hopefully he keeps it up and, and uh, really hoping for good things for Jake. And, and, you know, there's a couple other local guys out here, Douglas James, Matt Vandegrift. These are guys who, who've got bright, bright futures ahead of them. Lucas Riley. Uh, I, I can't wait to, to see these guys just – blow up and hopefully make it to AEW or even WWE. They, they all deserve to get to that stage. Awesome. So shout out to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, is the job any different from an indie wrestling show to a large stadium at AEW? If so, how? That's from our fan, uh, a fan tweet, Andy. Um, cool question, Andy. Um, all reality, you know what? It's really not. I mean, I know you, you'll hear the, uh, well, if you're in a big arena, you need to kind of over-exaggerate your moves so the people in the Raptors can understand your mannerisms and all that. And I guess there's that's true to some degree. But in all reality, I try to treat it pretty much like it's another show. I try to block out the size of the crowd and not really worry about how, how big it is. A uh, big thing that you you notice is the, the, the one-on-one or the verbal interactions with the wrestlers is, is lost in the big arenas mm-hmm. where you do an indie show and the referee and the wrestler can have some banter back and forth without the aid of a microphone and everyone in the building can hear it and laugh and understand what's being said or whatever. And obviously we don't have that ability in, in a big cavernous or, or arena. Um, another thing, big and and i really enjoy this is is that um on the indie levels especially myself maybe not a lot of other referees but i think over the last few months with the 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 big push for safety and everything that a lot of the referees have been uh utilizing 
uh, indie shows, we're kind of, I'm looked at more as, as uh, a first aid guy sometimes, or if someone's hurt or needs help, is there, do you have something that can help or, you know, do you have a, have band-aids or, you know, can you, can you get this or, or, or bandages or hydrogen peroxide, something, you know, so I, cause I've always got first aid stuff and all that. And I kind of like not having that pressure or that worry at AEW because we've got a doctor at ringside. We've got a, and he's got a whole medical crew there, the whole staff of people we're taken care of in that regard. I don't have to worry about their well being and in, in the, as far as, you know, taking care of them after they're hurt or anything like that. So I don't have to worry about that at AEW and I do kind of worry about that probably more than I need to at, at uh in independent shows. Hmm. Um you know, I had a scary situation a long time ago where El Generico got knocked out in the ring oh. and uh it's something I kinda have nightmares about because it was a three way match, I think it was like Steen, Generico, and AJ Styles, and AJ clothesline Generico, something bad. He got knocked out, and, I mean, he was snoring in the ring. Oh, no. And Kevin told me, Ro- roll him over, just roll him to the apron, keep going. And I was like, okay. You know, so I kind of pushed him over to the side, and we continued with the match while he slept on the apron for five, six minutes. Oh, wow. That's whole, that the worst thing I should have ever, I should have just stopped the match. In hindsight, I'm like, my God, I, he could have died. So many things could have gone wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I, and at the time I was following Kevin's lead and he probably didn't know any better, but you know, something like that would not happen today. Uh, that match would be done. I'd be stopping that match and he'd be getting taken care of. And then maybe we'd restart it as a singles match with the other two guys or yeah. so. I don't know, mm-hmm. but, uh, definitely made the wrong decision by continuing that match and letting him just sleep on the apron. It was, I, I can't believe I did that. That's insane. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I would go through my head. I couldn't even imagine what you're going through. I'm sorry, but <laughs> that was horrible. Um, so, Tiff, I'll let you read that next fan question, and I'll end it off there. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so we have one uh, final fan tweet from our girl, Queen. What potential matches are you looking forward to getting to um, call or be a part of in AEW? Oh, wow. Let's see. Um, I would love... Uh, I, I mean, inevitably, you know, Kenny Omega, even though his record is not the greatest right now, <laughs> uh, record, and, and that's something that's going to be emphasized in AEW. But, you know, at some point he's going to get his shot. I would love to be the ref for his title shot, and I hope it's against Jericho so they can get another mm. shot at each other. Uh, you know, there, there's so many. I, I'm seeing that the first week uh, of the tag tournament um, – the young first or second week of the tag tournament, young bucks are going to wrestle private party. I'm hoping I'm the ref for that one. I'm sure I will be. <laughs> uh, gosh, there, there's, there's just so many possibilities with the roster we've got. And some of the, the guys that I know that are being looked at and potentially going to be coming in. Uh, there's a lot I can't say or can't really say, uh, Ooh. let you in on, but, um, okay. just know it's <laughs> going to be happening. And, uh, the bigger, the better, I hope, but there, there's just, Pretty much everyone on the roster is exciting to work with, and, and uh, I expect big things from. So I know that's kind of a sugary answer, but it is kind of the truth. I'm looking forward to all the matches. I'm shaking in anticipation right now. It's oh, crazy. Yeah. Um, and I can't wait because I'll be I'll be traveling down for that uh, first taping in D.C., so I'll be there live. I can't wait to watch that and definitely watch you live there as well, obviously. <laughs> Be there to, we'll be together for yeah. full gear. And then we're uh, so. traveling down to Baltimore. We'll be together there for full gear and part of StarCast and all that stuff. Can't wait for that. <laughs> all right. Well, please come up and say hi. Yeah. Oh, definitely. 100%. Sure. Absolutely. Um, so, cool. uh, so we're going to finish this off here with one final question here. I wish we can get to all the fan tweets, but uh, just do our time constraints. We want to keep this uh, interview a little bit short here. But, uh, uh, we'll finish off with one final question here to all the inspiring, I guess, uh, amateur wrestlers out there, or maybe to even someone out there that wants to be, become a professional uh, wrestling referee. Uh, what is some advice that you would bestow upon them and, and give them uh, growing up here in this business? Um, I know it's kind of a, kind of a corny thing to say, but it, it's true. Um, and, and, it's, and it's not just, you know, how to, how to, to go about wrestling, but I mean, just life in general, this is a, a, a quote that my, my good friend, Adam Pierce uses quite a bit. And it's real simple. It's work hard, treat people fairly, earn their respect. 
you do those three things, everything else falls in line for you. As far as, you know, where do I go? I want to be involved in wrestling. I want to be a referee. I want to be a wrestler. How do I do it? It's easier now than it's ever been. Back in the day when I started, there were, there, there, you know, wrestling schools were unheard of. I, I lucked into the one that I found. Uh, now pretty much every metropolitan area is going to have some ex wrestler who's training people, uh, some school, um, your best bet is to fall in with these guys and offer your services. If you think you're going to make money in independent wrestling, that's probably not going to happen. You need to be able to realize that you're going to sacrifice time. You're going to sacrifice money. I see a lot of people get bitter and disgruntled and leave independent wrestling after a year because they come in and they latch on to some independent promoter or company and think, I got big ideas. I'm going to be your booker. I'm going to change this company. We're going to get on TV, yada, yada, yada. Same crap you hear all the time. And it doesn't work that way. And they end up leaving and talking bad about the wrestling promoter, blaming them. I mean, I've seen this story played out so many times. You have to go in and realize, hey, I got to do what I'm told. I'm going to volunteer my time. If they want me to sweep the arena, I'm going to sweep the arena. They want me to help build the ring. I'm going to build the ring. They want me to help scrub down the canvas. I'm going to do that. You have to volunteer that stuff. You stick around long enough. You will start getting utilized and uh, you'll start getting booked. Uh, It's just the nature of wrestling. It's a lot of back scratching and a lot of who do you know and how do I ingratiate myself into this scene? And don't think uh, because you've got a good, look or or you've been watching wrestling all your life you're going to walk into one of these places and shoot to the top it it doesn't work that way uh you got to make your bones and pay your dues just like everyone else and and uh you know after a certain amount of time if you're lucky the opportunities will start coming and it's just how it, how it goes and same thing with with any aspect in life uh treat people the way you want to be treated yourself and Respect will come. Be a hard worker, and you'll be rewarded. And uh, the talent will come. If the talent's not there, work on it. It'll get there. And uh, hard hard work and good talent is always rewarded. You'll always get your chance one way or the other. I couldn't have asked for a better answer. That was, <laughs> that was that, amazing. That was right on <laughs> the spot there. That was great. <laughs> uh, but thank you, Rick. Um, so. Thank you. <laughs> unfortunately we're at the end of this interview we do want to appreciate you for coming on rick and letting obviously our fans out there and the aw fans out there who rick knox is and what he thinks of certain topics so we do want to thank you very much from the bottom of our hearts myself and tiff for coming on and doing this interview with us today hey kyle and tiffany thank you guys it was very much a pleasure and uh, maybe we can do it again sometime and get to what we didn't get to awesome for sure and uh we'll definitely uh come see you and uh visit you down in uh, baltimore for uh star yeah, for sure definitely <laughs> awesome, so. Awesome. awesome so ladies and gentlemen that's gonna wrap it up here for episode number 41 of the all Lee podcast right here on the no holds bar network your source for wrestling podcast content and more I'm your host, as always, of the All Elite Podcast, your self-proclaimed greatest host, Kyle Masters, always joined by my co-host. She is the executive vice president of Giggles and the heartbreak chick, Tiffany. Uh, guys, remember to follow us on social media. Follow Rick Noss on, on, on social, arena, uh, social media for sure. His link will be down in the description for you. At Matt, it'll be a, at Matt Ref. I forget. I think there's a number there. That's right. <laughs> but uh, make sure you follow him as well, guys. His Twitter link will be down there. Uh, gosh, I don't know. I, I, I no, get them all confused. Twitter and Instagram. I think on Instagram I might be Arnox referee. Yeah, uh, Mad yeah, Mad on Twitter. Yeah, we'll find out. You know I'll put them all down in the description for you guys to follow. Thank you again, Rick, for tuning or for joining us in this interview, guys. We'll see you guys this week again for the next episode of the All Elite Podcast. <laughs>